So, welcome to the uh, Petrophysics Laboratory here at Melbourne University, Earth Sciences. One of our key roles is actually expanding the data set available to geologists and particularly people who've actually extracted drill core and the like. And petrophysics being the whole, the sense of the actual physical measurements that we can take and subsequently use to interpret geophysical modelling and uh, ex exploration techniques that are all, are all associated with that. Now our key data sources are typically items such as drill core, of which uh, exploration companies and geological surveys spend a vast amount of money to try and get a picture of the Earth's, the shallow crust of the Earth. The other technique that we use or materials that we use are discrete data and um, discrete samples, be it cut core such as this piece or in fact blocks which generally have been cut from drill core as well. Now in terms of drill core we do have a range of uh, measurement capabilities because drill core, this particular one, nominally 45 millimetres in diameter, typically called N cube. We also deal with HQ which is a larger, a larger diameter or BQ which is a smaller diameter and in fact there's a whole breadth of uh, drill core sizes that are used in the industry both in the minerals and in the petroleum but these are by far the most common certainly for land based uh, activities. So I'll, we'll just walk around the lab a little bit give you a bit of a sense of what uh, sort of capabilities that we do have here. We have techniques such as uh, thermal scanning, again typically aligned with drill core, as you can see it's a, a long device so we can actually scan longitudinally as well as uh, axially on various core pieces. So that's a very useful instrument this one. Uh, we have a range of other techniques such as the uh, Delta XRF, uh, portable XRF, in fact this one is also affixed to our scanner. Magnetic susceptibility, pressure and shear wave and analysis. This is of discrete samples, particularly. It's a very useful technique and very, very quick to actually capture a remarkable amount of high quality data. Aligned with PNS waves for the mechanical properties, moduli, um, various moduli, engineering moduli field samples, we can use a, a resonance tester and even a, a Schmidt hammer. These, in fact, Particularly the Schmidt hammer has some application out in field work as well. So the, the central piece of technology in the petrophysics laboratory is an instrument that effectively ties all these other discrete techniques together in a capability that allows you to scan drill core that we've just looked at recently. So we can actually place a piece of drill core one to one and a half metres, most of it's typically about one metre. but uh, we do have the capability of longer for particularly marine cores and it then measures sequentially and automatically uh, techniques such as gamma density, P wave, we don't have an S wave technique on here but that's uh, it's still quite remarkably informative to the P waves. Uh, XRF using the portable XRF which you can see is in fact it configured into the machine magnetic susceptibility using this uh, Bartington loop and then electrical resistivity and wrapping it all up at this end is our natural gamma capability which comes in two forms for rapid scanning drill core we will just capture total counts produced by uranium, thorium and potassium ion. primarily those three elements or the, their decay this machine is also capable of capturing full spectral uh, gamma profiles for um, analysis, particularly of things like uh, heat producing elements um, and gets quite a bit of use in that purpose. So this is actually called a multi-sensor core logger, not surprisingly. So, and in fact it takes on the order of about 10 minutes for a, a metre of drill core to go through there and have all the measurements recorded on it at a nominally two centimetre 
to perhaps 10 centimetre resolution depending on um, how much meterage you, you need to get through and how much core you need to log. Okay. Well, it's this instrument, most of it you can see is relatively passive. We have safety issues that we must be very much aware of and our black and white stripes here will draw your attention to the areas that I'm going to start talking about. And what they are is the gamma density in the first instance. This instrument combines a, a remarkably small source of uh, cesium-137, which is encased in this chrome section here, which is actually solid lead. So it's a cylinder of solid lead with several very modest holes in it. And then the gamma rays can be allowed out to pass through your sample as part of the measurement for density, because density effectively, the more dense it is, the more gamma rays the, your sample will absorb. And the remaining counts, or gamma rays that come through, are counted in this other cylinder, which is also lead encased, and has a sensitive, a, a, a very highly sensitive uh, detector inside. So, typically for, before you can use this kind of device, and they're normally locked, as this one is, so that only registered users are, can actually access it. So you will need radiation training, have to have completed the, particular, in this instance, the University of Melbourne's radiation course, before you and then go through um, lab-based training before you're allowed to use it. The second instrument on this here, as you can see, is also caution X-ray radiation. So we have gamma radiation here, and this device, many will recognise them as a handheld unit, but this one is actually configured into the firmware of the, the scanner. However, it still produces X-ray radiation because we want to get X-ray fluorescence from your sample, which will then give us elemental details. This specimen here, this set, sorry, this instrument here, um, is configured for uh, an, an up-down motion. Um, but again, because it's X-ray radiation, once you've completed your radiation course for this, this will have been included. But so you have to be registered to use either of these. So you'll find there's lots of signage in this in this lab and reminders of the radiation hazards that are here, both in the X-ray and natural gamma uh, and gamma ray. Sorry. Crucially. To in fact interact with any of these and use this equipment, you need to be authorised. And authorisation involves the training course um, provided by the university. There's also personal protective equipment that may in fact be required. Um, the basic um, personal equipment is you need enclosed footwear in here, simply if you don't want to drop anything. But we, because we're also handling heavy core, um, if we are handling pallets, then more specialised footwear needs to be worn and we actually have a rack here which uh, provides a full suite of steel cap boots for most, um, uh, most student sizes that we'd imagine. Now the other instruments on here that we briefly mentioned previously, the P wave, magnetic susceptibility, the electrical resistivity, are all very passive and uh, pose very minor um, issues. Similarly, this uh, rather significant looking device here, the natural gamma, despite its name, is actually a passive detector. It is not producing any gamma rays, it's simply recording the natural background either within the lab here or in uh, the samples, either your drill core or your discrete sample. It's measuring what's been admitted uh, emitted from your sample um, on each of these three separate detectors. Um, so this one does not require any special licensing to use as does the actual gamma source. Okay. Right. Go for it. So as, as part of the safety procedures associated with this kind of instrumentation, all laboratories in the university are, have to produce standard operating procedures or SOPs. Now this information is for when you're not certain about something, maybe you've only just recently been introduced to its use and its application. 
This will give you information on both the precise safety features as well as the, the initial operations. And you can see here we have, the, the, in this case, the, the X-ray, the gamma ray. We also have it for the general operations of the scanner itself because it actually has moving features which you need to be aware of so that you don't catch um, any clothing or uh, body parts in it. And this will be standard in. We also have similar SOPs for our discrete instruments such as the PNS wave, the discrete PNS wave, the discrete MAGSUS units. So many of these SOPs and um, related documentation are up on the board along the back of the lab. Okay, Dave, do you want to tell us a little bit about what these instruments are actually measuring and how that then relates to the properties that we're interested in? So this is a crucial part to all instrumentation of this, of this sort. For example, our gamma density unit here, not surprisingly, is designed to measure density. But in actual fact, it's actually designed to give you an answer on the density of the specimen. It doesn't measure density. What it measures in this instance is counts per second. So it's recording any of the gamma rays that are coming through in the form of counts and then those counts have to be converted into a density. And in the case of the natural uh, the, of the gamma density we need several things in addition to the, those counts. Uh, which is counts per second. We also need to know the, the thickness of the specimen um, so that we know how far they, the gamma rays have had to travel um, before they, while they've been getting absorbed. In the case of the P-wave P sensor, so what we have here is, a, is a, a transmitter and a receiver. And the transmitter is punching out a, a very small pulse at very high rates and that pulse propagates through the material from one side to the other and it's picked up by the receiver. What we need to know there is, is the distance again and we also need to know the time and in fact the P wave velocity is a function of how much time it takes to go that distance um, and in order to compare it we need, it needs to be standardised. Uh, as it turns out, this device, you can probably see a red mark on my finger just there. This device also has a laser, laser measurement to record the actual distance itself. It's measuring the distance and then the, we can convert the, the time measurement from these sensors into a velocity. In the case of the XRF, um, it's also it's emitting radiation, X-ray radiation, into your sample, and it goes typically covers an area perhaps the size of one's fingernail and a depth of perhaps about five millimeters in rock. The, then the sample, once it's been irradiated, it also emits radiation, which is recorded, and then gets converted into counts, and then we can convert that into elemental quantities of. Uh, um, milligrams and, and, and ppm and the like. In the case of the magnetic susceptibility, we're also measuring, in fact, uh, it's, it's a standard amount and it's, it's given in standard values, SI values. We can also convert it to the older value if we wish, if you're comparing it to um, pre-decimal calculations you might be comparing it to some old core that to, uh, you've got from the core library or something like that that'll be CGS units um, but again it's it's giving you an electronic response which is based on the magnetic fields that it can be generated into your in your sample and in a similar field the resistivity does much the same it's measuring in fact current flow in your sample so when, when the sample stops over the resistivity meter, the electrical resistivity, it generates a current as we have magnetic fields create 
um, current flow and it then measures the millivolts of that current flow. We then have to convert that millivolts into uh, ohms, ohm meters, which is the resistivity, or its inverse, which is Siemens per meter. The natural gamma, a bit like the gamma density, um, is actually recording counts. So when your sample goes in there, what we do know is that if it contains uranium, thorium or potassium, it will be emitting gamma rays. Very modest numbers by comparison to the gamma source. But uh, to give you some idea, the background uh, radiation of uh, natural gamma is in the order of about 100 counts per second. And so typically we have to allow for that. We capture, we measure that just to check it. We subtract it from what this machine then is recording out of your sample. And the difference is how much your sample is uh, generating in terms of counts for each of those three elements or the decay of those three elements. We can also, this one, these, those counts can actually be plotted by their energy value from zero to 3000 um, volts in terms of energy and that plot then gives you a what's called full spectral measurement it takes much longer to do a, that as opposed to about 15 to 20 seconds for a full count measurement on a sample like this in order to get a full spectral measurement it'll take 60 minutes right so dave is now going to unlock and open up the source for the um, gamma density and then we're going to talk about the calibration of this particular piece of equipment. Every single um, separate sensor on this rig requires calibration and the calibrations are carried out using samples with known values relative to what property the sensors are trying to record. So in the front of our lead cylinder here, which contains our source, we have a, a rotating face, which you can see has a, has a handle here. Now, at the moment that handle hasn't, isn't in the horizontal position. It's normally locked in the horizontal position that we've just unlocked it from. And when it goes into the horizontal position, the gamma ray beam can pass through a very small hole and then in through the sample and into the detector. We don't level this out, hence open the collimator until we've actually got a sample in front of the, 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 the actual source. Otherwise, um, otherwise it's likely we, what will happen is we'll tend to give too much energy to the re recorder side to the detector and it actually wears that out much quicker so as well as being a safety issue so as part of that safety we're now re going to recover so we can't accidentally put hands in there you'll see that one of the um, safety signs that appears here and on the door is that before the lab is vacated the gamma source must be sealed and locked off. Right, so Dave is now going to actually calibrate the, the gamma density using a sample with known thickness and known density. Dave. Yeah, in this case it's a, our, our aluminium, our NQ sized aluminium and I've placed it in, again in front of the beam channel which isn't open as yet and now we can actually open it. So there are now actual gamma rays passing through this piece of aluminium and then into the detector where they're being measured. We can now have a look on the computer and we can actually monitor, see precisely how many counts are actually being recorded. So we're actually taking one second samples and 
as you can see now, we're in the order of about 13,000 counts. That's counts per second, CPS. We're checking the calibration at the moment and we're using our NQ core which is 47.6 millimeters in diameter. Uh, we're recording nominally 13,000, so we'll enter 13,000 counts. One, three, zero, zero, zero. Enter. And that gives us a density of 2.79. And in fact, that's pretty good. That's uh, typically would be in the order. Well, if we go look at one of the slightly lower ones, 12, 931, 12931, 2.81. The key thing to note here is that by reducing the counts, we're actually, it's telling us that more has been absorbed and so the, the density, the apparent density will rise. But 13,000 is probably, in fact, is what we would anticipate. Now, and that's very close to the density of the aluminium bar that we've placed in there. To give you a guide, um, we've also got in our spreadsheet here a background on how the gamma density, its, its operating principles and in fact a little bit about the source and how it actually generates the information that we're seeing on the screen. Um, so at this point our sample our calibration check sample, the aluminium bar, has been moved forward and is now located between the P wave sensor uh, transmitter and receiver. And it's quite a nice snug fit. It's um, spring loaded, the, the carriers that move it in there, so it maintains a good strong tension on the, on the sample. The, um, and this is the direction that the samples in a full core would also move next to that. Now the other thing with the, the P-Wave is measuring several things. Um, it's measuring the time taken to transmit through that material from one side from our transmitter to our receiver. But it's also measuring the energy of the peak that arrives. And if we have a quick look now, we can actually see what the effect of that is. So here's our Here's our travel time, 19.7 microseconds. We have an amplitude measurement, which is in millivolts per volt. So the amplitude, when we plot it, here's our time function, and the vertical component on this graph is the amplitude or energy of the wave that's received um, by the receiving sensor. And we have a period where it's produced and then there's a time delay and included in this time delay as it transmits across the solid uh, there is some variation that it will pick up and some of that will be related to the actual contact material which is effectively a, a rubber patch on both sides on the transmitter and receiver and then once we get beyond that then we get into a much a significantly almost twice the size uh, twice the energy amplitude and that's the point at which we wish to record, which gives us our 19.7 microseconds. The giveaway is, is that this function here is actually all in the positive. Then the next one goes negative, as you'd expect for a standard full waveform. That's the one we want. And that's the one that gives us the, the, the precise velocity that we're seeking for, the, for this material. Okay, beyond that, there is actually also a generated a, a shear wave at, and it's typically at about twice the time function of the P wave. So if we check now our 19.7 and if we have a look in our calculation here, that provides us with a velocity in meters per second of just under 6400 meters per second, which is as expected for the material, the aluminium clock. So reinforce it's important to be aware of of the fact that the difference in amplitude which is your up and down function if we change that amplitude the capture amplitude which is defined by this green line it changes the time function and then we start getting more and more error as expected you would uh, you wouldn't tend to if you move it out there 
you're, you're well off. So it turns out at the first sense of where, and in here you can. The so with the magnetic susceptibility, this is the loop. It is not possible to adjust the the actual instrument itself. It has a fixed calibration, and what we are simply doing is just checking that it has not gone too far. That it doesn't shift much from the actual measured amount from this calibration specimen. So this is at 931 by 10 to the minus 5 SI units and we place it centered in the loop so that the full magnetic field is actually sensing uh, the magnetic material that's in there and we're recording 908, 909 So the core that we're measuring today is this core from Altona and it consists of a, a basalt cap over sedimentary rocks that are variably weathered to depth and for the purposes of this demonstration we're going to use a massive, massive basalt core from about 31 feet down the, down the hole and so that's about 10 meters down the hole the reason that we're using this is because it will give us um, the full range of measurements. The rest of the samples we won't actually measure um, on this video, but what we will do is provide you with a spreadsheet that shows the measurements. So this is the, the core. You can see that it's marked with the distance down core, so that the arrow is indicating the downhole directions. And this is a piece of basalt and it's um, relatively massive there's no not a great deal of vesicularity about it and this is going to give us the full range of measurements for the purposes of this exercise so the downhole direction typically when we are scanning continuous core the downhole direction is towards the back of the machine this means that we're actually measuring from the surface down at depth with each step and it's important to maintain these figures otherwise it's very easy to lose um, the direction particularly in a massive material like uh, basalt. Or the, um, the paint and, and, and markings don't have any um, significant effect on the physical properties. There may be very, very slight conductivity changes at the surface, but those are not um, significant throughout the volume of the material that's been measured. For the purposes of the actual experiment now, we have the core placed in position. And in behind that, we've actually put a piece of granitic core, and that's not going to be measured for, for our experiment but we're using it as a safe way of pushing the material through um, in front of the gamma source. Okay. So. okay, gamma source is now open and we can take a measurement. So every second we're seeing a number of counts on the right hand column and those counts relate to the density of the material that is placed in front of the gamma source. So some of the gamma is being absorbed by the material and the remainder is passing through the material and being counted on the other side. So the lower the gamma counts, the lower the um, counts per second, the more dense the material. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. yes. The lower, a lower count means less is being received by the... Mm. So this is a, a very reproducible specimen? Very, yes. Dave, what would happen if we 
put the vesicular basalt in front of the same source, would you expect to see a similar reproducibility? You would expect presumably more variability as well as you move the sample along. Yes, yes, because the unpredictable nature of the, the size and uh, number of voids that you're likely to encounter with the beam, so there would be yeah, some variability that you wouldn't see in a massive specimen. Okay. So now the basalt has been pushed through the gamma source and is now in front of the P-wave velocity platens and or between the P-wave velocity platens and the next measurement that we take will be to measure the P-wave velocity of, um, of, of a pulse travelling through the core from side to side across the diameter. And so here we're now seeing the actual the actual profile of that pulse and we're having a very clear transition from transport through the material and then it's the actual we're getting the pulse picked up by the receiver and we're getting 22.42 microseconds in very fairly close proximity to the amount that we were seeing previously 23.3 very small change in the velocity from from 4900 to 5300 meters per second so the p wave velocity sensors have just pulled away from the core and that allows the core to now be pushed through if we were going to do portable XRF, if we're going to do XRF, we would have done it at that stage. There's the XRF sensor mounted above the core. And now it's, um, the core is placed directly through the magnetic susceptibility sensor. So the loop is around the middle of the core. So we're now getting magnetic susceptibilities between 980.7 and 980.9, maybe 980, close to 981. And previous measurements of this sample were 972. We'll go 980. 0.8. Giving a, a volume corrected specific um, magnetic susceptibility, susceptibility of 1168. The core is now sitting above the resistivity tester. And tell me, Dave, does this work with direct contact? No, no, it's, it induces a magnetic field in, in the specimen and then from which it, it measures the um, current flow. What we're getting readings of now is a millivolt output from the sensor and they will now input that into the spreadsheet which then calculates an electrical resistivity in ohm meters yeah and currently 1.22 so the core is now um, sitting through the cylindrical receptor of the um, natural gamma sensor and the instrument is now set up to record the natural gamma. What are the units here? These are counts per second. Okay. So this is the total counts per second generated by the background and the sample together. Okay, so these are these. This is a combination of background and samples, and and what we see here is that because this is passive, the um, the actual counts per second are relatively low by comparison to, or very low by comparison to the active counts that were being put out by the, the natural the, by the gamma source. Yes, yes, so order several orders of magnitude lower. Right. We are currently also capturing full spectral data. 
So, and, and at this point, we actually can already can identify the peak for potassium. Right. The uh, peaks for thorium and for uranium are, are less well defined at this point, but uh, we, it's very clear we can see potassium, um, despite it being a basalt, um, potassium is still quite clearly seen. Yeah. The background at the moment is on the order of 90 counts per second, so in fact we're, on, we're talking about 12 counts per second from the sample. Right, so even though we can see the, the, the potassium peak, the actual net volume of potassium that is contributing to that peak is actually really quite low. That's correct, yeah. yes. So a, a, a more potassium sample would give you a greater number of counts per second um, because, uh, you know, over the background levels. Although we have only shown you in this video one sample passing through the test rig, in reality, we have data for the whole suite of lithologies that exist down the core of the uh, down the Altona core, and that is the data that you're going to get in a spreadsheet to um, allow you to analyze that data for your assignment. So you're going to need to look at the the spreadsheet, read the um, assignment worksheet that comes with that and um, use those two things to put together your interpretation of this core.